Jesus made this uh, marvelous comment, you, you know, um, he quoted from uh, the Old Testament, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength, but he also added mind. Mm. And I believe that's crucial for uh, Christians uh, today that they need to also use their minds in addressing the great uh, issues that challenge us uh, today. In terms of the contrast, some people see faith as believing in something without necessarily having con concrete evidence. Science, at least in theory though, uh, tests a hypothesis and, and searches for, uh, I suppose, knowable truth. Yes, although it's amazing how much overlap there is, in fact, because that hypothesis that is tested is often uh, built upon a, a, a hunch, you know, a belief in a particular uh, perspective in the research topic that one is working in. Mm. Um, and that's a very strong uh, role that is played, um, the role of uh, intuition and belief. And of course, in science, there is this fundamental belief in uh, the coherency of nature, the role of physical law. And um, we need to remember that the scientific, the modern empirical scientific method came out of Christendom. Mm -hmm. Uniquely, it came out of Christendom. Um, the forefathers and mothers, shall we say, mm -hmm. of uh, modern science uh, were to a large percentage committed uh, Christians. I think it's very important for um, secular people nowadays to understand that, that um, not only our scientific institutions actually, but many of our social institutions, uh, our freedom, our understanding of uh, personal individual freedom, uh, democracy, um, all of this is derived from a uh, Christian understanding of the world. Some people look at, the, I suppose, the history of the relationship between God and science is that it's had its rough patches, surely, with, uh, well, Galileo, Copernicus, well, Charles Darwin to a certain extent as well. And I suppose in that has been this, this theory that, um, that the theologians and the scientists have been at war with each other over what is truth. That's often the impression that's conveyed in, in this simplistic history of, uh, of many of these events. But we have to remember, uh, for example, Galileo himself was a committed Christian. Mm -hmm. And many of the forefathers of science believed that the study of nature was the appropriate response to God's uh, created world. Uh, the world about us is marvelous. It uh, follows principled um, law. Uh, and so it should be as part of the worship of God e explored. And um, these were the driving principles of, of many of the um, early scientists. Jeff, there, I mean, there seems to be at least a perception that there's a negative attitude towards religion and faith from those within the scientific community. Has that been your experience? It's there. It's, it's definitely there. And uh, of course, we have uh, in the present climate, um, there is a new set of uh, pretty aggressive um, atheists who are um, parading... And Hitchens and the like, yes. Uh, absolutely. Mm. And um, they are parading their position uh, as a scientific position. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that's not the case. Um, it's ideologically... Their position is ideologically driven and it actually leads them to many sort of um, failures of logic. So we have Stephen Hawking, for example, yeah. saying, all you need is gravity and the universe will self-create itself. And somehow this brilliant man, wonderful man, who's contributed so much to science, overlooks the fact that gravity is a part of this universe. It's a property of this universe. So it's like saying, all you need is the universe, and hey presto, you've got the universe. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is worrying. And I think it's when scientists have a position which is purely ideologically driven, that is not science. That's not the way science uh, operates. How should we respond to people like this? Because as you say, some of these people are intellectual <clears throat> giants and it's, it's, it's perhaps easy for uh, well, a lay person to be bamboozled by the strength of their arguments. How can we respond with, with intelligence but also with grace? There is a tendency for um, people to, to be almost vitriolic mm -hmm. in their attacks on people like Hitchens and Hawkins. Um, and that needs to be avoided. I mean, it's, at some point, 
these people, like Anthony Flew, who was a lifelong, committed and very public atheist, who at the age of 82 finally came to the conclusion there must be a creator because the universe about us is so finely balanced, so beautifully balanced, and, and the biological world uh, just presents us with one impossibility after another. And he had to abandon, at age 82, his very public atheism. And we have to remember that the same may well, we pray that the same will happen uh, for Richard Dawkins and, and um, his colleagues. And so we must be gracious in the way in which we respond. But at the same time, we must be very definite, I think, um, in our re response to uh, these issues because the public at large soaks us in osmotically um, begins to assume that these people are right and that people of faith are people of blind faith, that um, evidence and, and the mind and thinking uh, don't come into play. Well, of course they come into play. Looking at, I suppose, the, the different intellectual disciplines, there is, I suppose, rational thought and science and, as I say, supposedly provable truth. Is there still a space in, in the modern mind and in intellectual thought for such disciplines as philosophy or even theology, do you think? Can these work together to help us move forward to find truth? Well, absolutely. But uh, along with everything, um, you need to use your judgment as to... Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of these issues that we're talking about, when you get down to the nitty gritty, are actually very complex. And um, it does require discernment to understand how to respond um, to issues. And it's very difficult, particularly in the scientific field, for people who are not um, trained in science to latch on to certain ideas and to run with them um, when those ideas are not really sound. So there are, there are lots of pitfalls. There are lots of pitfalls with philosophy, but of course philosophy teaches us some very basic things, mm -hmm. um, such as logic, for example. And I mentioned Stephen Hawking a, a moment ago. Um, he says philosophy is dead. Well, if he studied philosophy, he would not make the mistake that he made, <laughs> that circular argument where he said, all you need is gravity and, and the universe will uh, self-create. Um, you know, that's a tautology and yeah. these sort of things are taught in philosophy. Yeah. So um, there's useful understanding that comes from all of these disciplines. But of course, any discipline can be subverted. Even the use of the Bible, of course, can be subverted. So we need wisdom and discernment. And of course, the apostles encouraged us, um, affirmed that we have to use discernment in, in everything that we uh, address in our Christian lives, in our public lives, uh, secular lives, whatever it is. Mm. You know, in, in my mind, there's no division. Those are false divisions to talk of our public life, secular life, sporting life, uh, faith life. Yeah. Um, we have one life here, one opportunity created, gifted to us by grace, by our creator. And uh, there can be no divisions between uh, the different aspects of our lives. And that's the challenge, of course, is to, um, to bring our faith into every um, aspect of our lives in a way which is coherent and meaningful and not arrogant or proud or anything like that, but really um, love of God drives everything that we do. That's the challenge. I know that's the challenge. I know that's what I have to do in my life, but do I do it? Um, I don't do it as much as I would wish to.